Okay, so what I'm going to try to do now is um, set up again this, um, this equation and do the analog of, of what we're doing there and try to determine this um, function fk in some nice way. All right. So let's think of this equation. I, I, I want to do it in pieces. So psi of r is going to be equal to some formula. And then it has to be equal to this right-hand side. Let's write the e to the i k z the way we've done it before. Uh, it's up there. So I'll write it here. Square root of 4 pi over k, square sum of l equals 0 to infinity, uh, square uh, root of 2l plus 1, i to the l, y l 0, 1 over 2i, e to the i, k r minus l pi, over 2, over r, minus e to the minus i, k r, minus l pi over 2. Wow, it's tiring, this r. Plus f of k of theta e to the i, k r, over r. OK. So what do we have here? We've written the right-hand side of this equation. I copied it. I have not done anything except taking r much greater than a. Because otherwise, in the plane wave e to the i k z, I could not have expanded the Bessel functions unless I took r greater than a. But that's good, because we now have our waves. OK? We have our waves there. Now, look at this right-hand side. Where is the incoming wave in this right-hand side? The incoming wave is here. That's the only term that is incoming. Because this is an outgoing wave, and this is an outgoing wave. So if I want to write a left-hand side, the incoming wave of the left-hand side has to be equal to this wave. And the, of course, the outgoing wave of the left-hand side will also have to be equal to whatever is outgoing here. But the incoming must be this. So I'm going to write this left-hand side and already use this and put 4 pi over k square sum of l equals 0 to infinity, 2l plus 1, i to the l, y l 0, 1 over 2 pi, big parentheses, and one outgoing wave, and one incoming wave, minus i k r minus l pi over 2 over r. And here, I don't know what to put. But I've put already there, on the left-hand side of this equation, for psi of r, for the full solution, a wave that matches the right-hand side because it has the same incoming wave. wave.
And now I'm going to use some physical intuition to guess what we have to put on this part. This is the step that requires a little imagination, not too much because we already did something similar here. Uh, so what's happening here? And here is the intuition I think you should keep after weeks of this course, uh, when they all forgotten, there's some intuition that you should keep. Um, and it's about the scattering happening for each partial wave independently. Yes. 2i, yes. No 2 pi there. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So here it is. This is a, a solution. And we've got the intuition already. I will justify this later, of course, very precisely. But I think at this moment, you need to have a little bit of a, an intuition of what you should do. And first, we said each L works separately to create a solution of the Schrodinger equation. That's superposition, and it's there in that double. Each L is working separately. Each L is like a scattering problem. Each L has a wave that comes in and a wave that comes out. Because these things, J and N, have waves. And they have an in and an out. So this has some in wave and some out wave. And if each wave works separately and it has an in wave and an out wave, in a scattering problem, these waves must have the same amplitude. Because otherwise, they wouldn't have the same probability current. And probability would get stuck. So this must be an outgoing wave having the same amplitude as this wave. And by the argument we had here, it just differs by a phase. So we'll put here e to the i kr minus l pi over 2 plus 2i delta L over R, so that it is a wave, a spherical wave, that it's outgoing, it has the same amplitude as this one, and it cannot be the same. The only difference can be a phase shift. And that's the phase shift. So your picture is scattering in three dimensions looks like, OK, you threw in a plane wave, and out came a spherical wave out. The other picture that is more consistent with the way you solve it is that you have an infinite set of partial waves for different Ls, each one scattering, the L equals 0, the L equal 1, the L equal 2 all of them scattering. So this corresponds to an answer in terms of phase shifts. And now we can, you can say you've parameterized your ignorance in a physical way. You've discovered that all that characterizes the scattering is, as it was in one dimension, a phase shift. In one dimension, there was a single phase shift because you didn't have all these general solutions that you had in three dimensions. Your energy eigenstates were momentum eigenstates that were non-degenerate, really. Uh, there was just a couple of momentum eigenstates, waves in and waves out. Here is infinitely degenerate. There's spherical stuff. So there's a phase shift for each value of L. 
So we've parameterized the physics of the scattering problem in terms of phase shifts, and now it's interesting to try to figure out what is this quantity, after all, in terms of the phase shifts. And it's already here. We just have to solve it. So from this equation, I now can say that this term cancels with this term. And now I can solve for this term f of theta e to the i k r by collecting these other two terms together. And therefore, f k of theta e to the i k r over r is equal. It's exactly the same thing I did here. Cancel here, pass, and the mathematics is going to be completely analogous, except that I have to carry all that sum there. Um, no big deal. So what is it? Square root of 4 pi over k, sum from l equals 0 to infinity, 2l plus 1, i to the l, y l 0. 1 over 2i. OK, 1 over 2i. OK, I'll do it this way. Uh, e to the 2i delta L minus 1, e to the i k r, e to the minus i L pi over 2. I think I got everything there. I put. Uh, the first term on the right-hand side, I moved it to the left-hand side. The coefficient was all the same. This was the coefficient. They both had the same coefficient. Then I just have to subtract these two exponentials over r. So I did forget the r. Uh, so I just subtract the two exponentials. Both exponentials have the e to the i k r minus l pi over 2. And the difference is that the first exponential on the top has the extra e to the 2i delta l minus 1, and the other one doesn't. So what do we get here? This part is e to the i delta sine delta. And this part is e to the minus i pi over 2 to the power l, which is minus i to the l. And i to the l times minus i to the l is happily just 1 i times minus i is 1, and 1 to the l is 1. So this term and this term cancel. So finally, and I can cancel happily. The r dependence is all the same. I can cancel this r dependence, this r dependence. And finally, we've got fk of theta equals square root of 4 pi over k sum from l equals 0 to infinity, square root 2l plus 1, y l 0 of theta, e to the i delta l sine delta l. So that's it. That's our formula for fk in terms of the phase shifts. So what have we achieved? We want f of k because that gives us the cross section. What we have figured out is that the calculation of fk really requires knowing the phase shifts. And the phase shifts are defined by that formula over there, where we have estimated how 
one wave is connected to the other one, the incoming and the outgoing, for a given fixed L, for a given partial wave, how they're offset by this phase shift. 